chapter 28, the last chapter. Who's enable us to do that, Lord? Thank you for your word. Thank you for the privilege of having it, Lord. Please, again, don't let us ever take it for granted when so many of our brothers and sisters do not have a Bible of their own, Lord. And they would do anything just for a page of your beautiful word, Lord. So, Father, please help us to be ever grateful, Lord. And as we come to your word now, we come, Lord, to the conclusion of the book of Acts in the Bible, not the conclusion of Acts in a sense, because, Lord, all the centuries after that have carried on. And still now, even today, Lord, your word goes forth, it is preached. People are saved, healed, set free, Lord. We praise you. Just speak to us now as we just look at your word, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Right, Acts chapter 28. You remember last week, 27, we're on Paul's final journey. Finally the Lord is... Oh, <laughs> sorry, he just put it back. So sorry. <laughs> just for a sec, sorry. Um, Paul finally is going where the Lord has promised him to take him to Rome to speak before Caesar. And remember, we went on the journey last week. We started at Caesarea. We've gone on a boat all the way up to Sidon, round Cyprus to miss the winds, got to Myra and changed to a larger ship that was going to carry on all the way to Rome. Um, we went up to Quidus, Salmone, round to Fair Havens, and there they hoped. It wasn't a place they could winter overnight, but by now we've hit the winter storms and everything. And they'd hoped that they could go and manage to just creep round the island to get to Phoenix, a winter there over the winter. But God has other ideas, so does the weather. Um, and the boat got blue instead where the winds took it. And we've gone all the way over here. And finally, um, they start to throw things off the boat. We know they start to cry out to God. And finally, they end up on an island. And they don't know where they are. They just know that they're on a pit finally. <laughs> they don't probably care where they are. Finally, after the shipwreck, and they've all swam or floated on bits of the boat to the shore, they've landed on the shore of an island. 28 verse 1. Now, when they'd escaped, then they found out that the island was called Malta. And the natives showed us unusual kindness, for they kindled a fire and made us all welcome because of the rain that was falling and because of the cold. But when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. So when the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom though he's escaped the sea, yet justice does not allow to live. But he shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. However, they were expecting he'd swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But after they looked for a long time and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. In that region there was an estate of the leading citizen of the island, whose name was Publius, who received us and entered us courteously for three days. And it happened that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and dysentery. Paul went into him and prayed, laid his hands on him and healed him. So when this was done, the rest of those on the island who had diseases also came and were healed. They also honoured us in many ways. And when we departed, they provided such things as were necessary. So 
So they find out, they talk to the locals that they've landed on the island called Malta. The natives come and the natives show them great kindness. They don't know. <laughs> Because of the rain and because of the cold, I mean, I should imagine more because they were shipwrecked. <laughs> they just got, got out the sea, having not, not fed for umpteen days and nearly drowned. Um, but the natives kindle a fire and make them all welcome. Remember, again, we're talking a long, long time ago. It doesn't whether natives are just the local people there, whether they are more, um, mine says here, literally barbarians. <laughs> Maybe um, you know, not as well brought up as some of the other people. And then we get this very strange little bit in here, really. Um, and just to show that what's still going on, this is still not the end of it. Paul gathers a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, just like all the people around him would have been. But as he does so, a viper, a snake, a serpent, comes out of the heat and fastens on his hand. And the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand. They would have known what it was, being local. They said to one another, no doubt this man's a murderer. Those who escaped the sea and all that he's gone through, yet justice does not allow him to live. But Paul just shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. Imagine this, for them not knowing anything, not knowing anything of what's gone on so far, etc., not knowing who Paul is or anything, or anything about God. <laughs> and just living in their native ways and superstitions. <laughs> Said Crumbs, this, this man, poor man, he's just finally got in from the shipwreck and everything, and now a snake attacks him. That, I mean, by the sound, it must be a poisonous snake, because they expected him to die from it. What they would have known what it was, you know, its colour or whatever, as to it was a dangerous snake. And they were expecting it to swell up or suddenly fall down dead, but after they'd looked for a long time. <laughs> so, I, mean, I don't know, you can't sort of imagine this scene that Paul sort of got, got it but shook it off by saying, not really bothered about it or took much notice of it. He's, he's probably then prayed immediately. Um, and they're sitting around the fire feeding them food. And all the natives, you imagine, sort of keep looking around. Wherever they are, they're sitting or something. They'll keep looking at Paul. You know, try not to look, but they all keep looking at Paul. They expect him any minute to just fall down dead. But after they looked for a long time and saw no harm to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. <laughs> Instead, because he'd survived a snake bite sort of fitted in well with their local superstitions. But again, we said last week, <laughs> even though Paul's been through so much, even though he's finally escaped as such from the Jews pursuing him and putting him in prison and wanting to kill him, he finally ends up on a boat going where God is taking him and then the boat is shipwrecked. God protects him from that, says you're going to speak in Rome, I've told you you're going to speak in Rome, nothing's going to stop you from what I've said and spoken and coming to pass. But still the enemy has another go. It's a viper, a snake, a serpent who has a go at Paul. It's a one, in a sense, last ditch effort. Even here at the last minute, Let's see if I can kill Paul and wipe him out. Poisonous snake, bite him. If it was a normal man, not a Christian, not somebody believing in God, they would well have died with the bite of that snake. They changed their mind, decided that he was a God. Paul shook it off in the fire and suffered no harm. I would imagine he would have prayed. <laughs> I mean, you know, he would have seen it probably dangling from him before he shook it off, knowing what it was, and would have prayed. God's protection was on him as well. He could either have been prayed and been healed from the bite. He could have just prayed divine protection from the bite, that nothing would happen to him. But again, he could claim God's promise. 
He could claim, God, you know, you've said that I will go to Rome. You've said all these promises. And could have reminded God of them. He could have prayed in the name of Jesus for healing or, or deliverance or the, you know, no harm to come to him. We all have those rights as well. I mean, hopefully we'd never get bitten by a snake like that, but we often underestimate the power, the right, the calling that we have as Christians and in Christ, that we could pray similar things to that. So then we find there's a, the leading citizen then, Publius, the highest ranking Roman official on the island. So again, he was the, the local Roman official in charge of looking after that piece of land for the Romans. And he invited them all, entertained them courteously for three days. I mean, bear in mind they're on the way to Rome. Remember, they've got Roman centurion and guards and, and that with them. So he's not just sort of being you know, generally nice to anybody who ever visits Malta and inviting them into his house. The Romans have gone there. He's a Roman citizen looking after the island. As part of that, he's invited them in and entertained them while they decide what's going to happen next. While he was there, the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and dysentery. Paul went into him, prayed, laid hands on him and healed him. So when this was done, the rest of those on the island who had diseases also came and were healed. Again, we've got this, almost we've had all the way, haven't we, through the book of Acts and certainly with Paul's life. Even here, we're, we're nearly getting as, as close as we can almost now to the end. And yet here still, there's an attack on Paul by the snake and Paul, every chance he gets... I've just been shipwrecked. I've been, you know, umpteen days, I mean, 14 days without food, it said, before they ate, before they reached the, the um, island, so longer than that. Hardly any food. Storms, lash, gale, sea, wet, cold, miserable. And yet here I am, the minute there's an opportunity to do God's work. I mean, it doesn't say here he preached, but I doubt if he, in a sense, just prayed without saying anything. Paul immediately is still doing what he's done, praying for those who are sick, laying hands on them. Once there's one miracle, once they've seen this high-ranking official's father made well by prayer, then everybody on the island with diseases comes and is prayed for. It's like a mass crusade. Whenever anybody, you get in Af many of the ones you read about with Christ for all nations there in Africa, they have the first day, they have a lot of people, but the first day it's always smaller and it grows through the week. As people hear of what's happening, people hear there's this great crusade, God's doing things, people are healed and that, you know, so and so from down the road they couldn't walk before, they walked. And yeah, they did, they walked. You know, and the next night, there's another 100,000 at the crusade and the night after. People are drawn by things like this. And again here, Paul's obedient to the Lord, uses the opportunity. Whoever knows what can come. Paul's took the gospel all the way over here. The, on, we don't need it at the minute, but we've done it all. The bigger map everywhere. Now he's going towards Italy. He's trying to get to Rome, but every opportunity on the way. Now Malta's heard the gospel. Now Malta knows about Jesus. Now people are healed on Malta by the power of God. Because of Paul. Because of God using him. And they honoured us in many ways, and when we departed, they provided such things as were necessary. Verse 11. After three months, we sailed in an Alexandrian ship whose figurehead was the twin brothers which had wintered at the island. And landing at Syracuse, we stayed three days. From there, we circled round and reached Regium. And after one day, the south wind blew and the next day we came to Putiole. 
sure I'll be for shot for some of these pronunciations by people that live there. Where we found brethren and were invited to stay with them seven days. And so we went toward Rome. And from there, when the brethren heard about us, they came to meet us as far as Appy Forum and Three Inns. When Paul saw them, he thanked God and took courage. Now when we came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard. But Paul was permitted to dwell by himself with the soldier who guarded him. So they were on Malta and there. They honoured us in many ways when we departed, provided such things as were necessary. After three months, they had to wait a further three months before finally sailing from Malta. Probably, as we said before, to wait probably around February, to wait for the winter sea season that we talked about earlier going past. So it was safe again to actually travel. They then started to go up, as we can see on the map there. So up from, they went from Malta up to Syracuse. Syracuse is the chief city on the island of Sicily. They stayed there three days. From there we circled round and reached Regium. And then one day, the south in blue, the next day we came to Pitioli. Oh, that's a long, long way up there, didn't I? It means the principal port of southern Italy. And then they go up this bit up the west coast then of Italy. Found, and um, there we found brethren invited to stay with them seven days. And so we went on to Rome. From there the brethren heard about us. They came to meet us as we went up the Appian Forum. What they went up, this is this pathway is known as the Appian Way and, um, in Italy. And they travel first of all up to the Appian Forum, which is 43 miles from Rome. And then they travel up to Three Inns, which is 33 miles from Rome. Um, so they carry on up to Rome. But what's surprising, you notice in there as well, sort of just throws out, when they got to Rome, now bear in mind, Paul has not been here before. We've had all the missionary journeys all over here, oh well, all over here, over Asia and modern Turkey, over Greece. We've not been over here and we've certainly never been to Italy. Yet when they get to Italy, we find brethren. When we get to Italy, we find brethren, Christians, already there. Praise God. It's not all Paul. <laughs> Praise God how he's used Paul. But God's in front of him now. <laughs> These people here, people that have got saved over here through Paul's journeys, have travelled that way, gone to Italy, started to tell the gospel themselves with people and share it. And there's now brethren there who believe. They came out, there we found brethren, they came out to meet us. They stayed there seven days. When Paul saw them, he thanked God and took courage. Can you imagine to Paul, he's going now, he knows where he's going, he's, he's absolutely wanting to fulfil God's will and what God has said to him. He doesn't know what's going to happen in front of him, he's just going to Rome. But to be encouraged, to find brethren there, to not, not, not once, he's not going somewhere he's been before, he's not thinking, oh, I'll stop at that city and I'll go to the church there that I set up. He doesn't know there's people here. And to find Christians, when he's, you know, he's in need of that encouragement. God has gone before him. And when they get to Rome, the said, and delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard, but Paul was permitted to dwell by himself with the soldier who guarded him. As a Roman citizen who'd committed no flagrant offence and who had no political aspirations, Paul was allowed to live in private quarters just with the soldier who guarded him. 
the prisoners, the real prisoners, who they took with them in the boat all the way, who had committed real crimes, they had to go to the captain of the guard in prison. But Paul, as a Roman citizen, and because, in effect, he was the one who'd appealed to Caesar, he now has no crime against him. He's allowed to live on his own, just with a soldier guarding him. You do find later on, when you get into the history of some of the letters after this, that Paul wrote to the churches, some of them he wrote in this period, while he's now, in a sense, under house arrest. Time to just sit there on his own and to write the letters to the churches. Verse 17. And it came to pass after three days that Paul called the leaders of the Jews together. So when they come together, he said to them, Men and brethren, though I've done nothing against our people or customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hand of the Romans, who when they'd examined me, wanted to let me go, because there was no cause for putting me to death. But when the Jews spoke against it, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, not that I had anything of which to accuse my nation. For this reason, therefore, I've called for you, to seek you and speak with you, because for the hope of Israel I'm bound with this chain. They said to him, We've neither received letters from Judea concerning you, nor have any of the brethren who come reported or spoken any evil of you. But we desire to hear from you what you think, for concerning this sect, we know it's spoken against everywhere. So when they'd appointed him a day, many came to him at his lodging, to whom he explained and solemnly testified of the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and the prophets from morning till evening. And some were persuaded by the things which were spoken, and some disbelieved. <coughs> so when they did not agree among themselves, they departed after Paul had said one word. The Holy Spirit spoke rightly through Isaiah the prophet to our fathers, saying, Go to this people and say, Hearing you will hear, and shall not understand, and seeing you will see, and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull, their ears are hard of hearing, their eyes they've closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their eyes and turn, so that I should heal them. Therefore let it be known to you that the salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will hear it. When he said these words, the Jews departed and had a great dispute amongst themselves. Then Paul dwelt two whole years in his rented house and received all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no one forbidding them. So again, Paul also takes the opportunity to talk to the Jews that are there as well the Jews that are around Rome. And he calls them together. And he starts to say, explain about his background and why he's here. And they tried to persecute him in Israel and that he'd appealed to Caesar. And they say, we haven't, we've, you know, we haven't heard anything about this. You know, Paul's, Paul's sort of getting ready to, to try and put his defence they don't actually even know anything about the issue. We've heard nothing about this. We haven't had any letters from Judea. They haven't sent any brethren to come and warn us or anything. But we have heard about this strange new sect that's going on. We have heard about it being spoken against everywhere. Tell us more about that. That's what we want to hear about. So they appointed him a day and many came to his lodging. And he persuaded them concerning Jesus from both the law of the Moses and the prophets from morning till evening. And some were persuaded by the things which were spoken and some disbelieved. Just the pattern we've seen all the way through with his preaching. Some will believe, but some will not. When they didn't agree with themselves, they departed. 
after Paul had preached one particular word from the prophet Isaiah, which we read out. The word really saying exactly what God knew would happen. And almost God, has, God had appointed to happen. You go to this people, the Jews, but actually they'll hear, but they won't hear. They won't understand. They'll see, but they'll not really see and be able to see what it is. Their hearts will grow dull, their ears hard of hearing, their eyes closed. Lest they should actually see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand and turn and believe, and I should heal them. There's a bit of a double thing here. God's almost saying that this is what I know would happen. I've seen, you know, this is in Isaiah. This is what the Jews um, were like then. Never mind about it, he also knew further down the line that they wouldn't believe in his son when they sent him. But it's a bit as well that God almost knew that would happen as well. And actually God almost appointed that to happen. The hardness of their heart is their own. God hasn't put it there. But he does know that they won't believe and they'll be hard of heart. Therefore he'll go to the Gentiles and therefore in the end days he'll call the Jews back. As Paul explains in Romans Therefore, Jews 28, let it be known to you the salvation as God has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will hear it and believe it. When he said these words, the Jews departed and had a great dispute among themselves. The closing message of Acts is that the Jews of Paul's day, from Jerusalem to Rome, rejected Jesus as their Messiah. Individual Jews believed, of course, but the torch of the gospel was passed from the Jewish nation to the Gentiles. Not only has Christianity spread from Jerusalem to Rome, it's also made the transition from an exclusively Jewish religion to a hope for all nations. Paul explains that in Romans 9 to 11. So Paul now really this comes to an end. God now finally is he's gone from Jerusalem to Rome. He's preached the gospel. He's gone in all the synagogues first. He's preached to the Jews first. Some Jews believe as it says obviously would do. But the majority not. They hold in their hearts as God said would happen. And so it's taken to the Gentiles. And really... From that point onwards, at the end of Acts here until now, 2,000 odd years later, or, yeah, something like that, um, the whole of the preaching of the gospel really has been to the Gentiles. So we then carry on. When you get a bigger a world map, don't bother, but a world map, the... the Gospel didn't stay then in Italy and in Rome. Rome then had a large part in it because we then get after Acts. What we need then is what's next? Where's Acts chapter 29? You then get on to the his early history of the church, the church fathers, setting of some of the rules, etc. Rome sort of, Rome and, and that begins to believe in Christianity as the religion of the empire then they can take control of it, then they can start imposing rules, etc. Um, and then you get on to, the, you know, we could spend hours then on things that I don't know much about, or the whole history then of Christianity down the ages, both for our nation and others. But it then continued to spread. You've then got people that would have gone out and started to take the gospel then to the rest of Europe. Eastern Europe, Western Europe, where we are, to our little island, on across to America. Then as it comes on, we've started to send missionaries out around the world. We've taken the gospel to Asia, to Africa. And the church is growing, you know, thousandfold around the earth, particularly in a lot of those other nations. That really is, acts as it was. Um, but 
But praise God, it doesn't end there. This is all we get. I mean, the Bible at some stage had to be published and put together. We can't wait till 2019 or 2000 and whatever <laughs> to put it together because there's a load more to put in it. The Bible says, I think John says at the end of, of the Gospel of John, doesn't he, that if they wrote all the books about what Jesus did, it would fill all the books in the world. <laughs> you know, what John quotes in a f few chapters is a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of what Jesus said and did while he was with them. If they wrote any more, if you then wrote the book of Acts from you know, whenever this AD, in the, sometime in the first AD, 10s, 40s, something like that, up to now, you know, imagine what you would write. <laughs> Every Christian's life in details and miracles and testimony <laughs> of every person that's believed since. Praise God. Let's just finish reading one thing. One, just, just think of Paul again for a minute. If you want, Paul later on sums up his life, 1 Corinthians 11. One Corinthians eleven twenty two to the end. He's, oh, hang on, that's not right. <clears throat> yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah, two eleven. Yeah, Paul's suffering. So he's talking about boasting and false apostles and everything, and he's really just recalling about his own life. Verse twenty two of two Corinthians eleven. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak of as a fool. I am more. In labours more abundant. In stripes above measure. In prisons more frequently. In deaths often. From the Jews five times I received forty stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked, a night and a day I've been in the deep, in journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils of the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. I won't finish reading, but if you want a summary about really of Acts and Paul's life, there is Paul summing it up as to all that happened. And praise God for the glorious gospel and the great things God did and how it spread. But there was a cost. You read Paul's bit there really and sum up. That was the cost for the gospel to be spread. Amen. <laughs>